my name is Mark Doolin, and I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm talking to Paul Pollard. Uh, Dennis and Paul Pollard, it, Dennis and Paul Pollard is the bass trombone in the Met Opera Orchestra. And Paul, I just lost you there. Hang on one second. Um, let me hide somebody. This, there we go. Let's try that. Okay, I'm going to go back to speaker view. Paul, say something, and it'll, it'll go back to your picture being really big. Hi, this is Denson Paul Pollard coming there to you go. from Bloomington, Indiana, home of Indiana University and the Jacobs School of Music. Exactly. He's also a professor at the Jacobs School of Music in Bloomington, Indiana. So you have quite a busy lifestyle under normal conditions. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, and just so everybody knows, do you normally go by Paul or by Denson or? Paul is, uh, that's, that's my family and friends address me as Paul. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Make, I want to make sure I got that right. Um, so I just kind of want to go through a couple things sort of, you know, to set the stage for where you are now and what you're doing and, um, and just kind of go from there. So can you talk, you, you're from Noonan, Georgia, which is about 30 minutes south of Atlanta, roughly somewhere around there, right? So can you talk a little bit about your beginnings on uh, in music and how that how that all came about. Absolutely, uh, I was actually born in Lagrange, Georgia, which is uh, even further south than Noonan. A couple of couple of more exits on I eighty five south, mm -hmm. and uh, moved to Noonan. Uh, my father took an, another job in Noonan when I was ten years old, and we moved there. And uh, it was in Lagrange where I actually started playing the trombone. I played uh, in fifth. Uh, I started in fifth grade. Back then, they started kids in band in fifth grade, and uh, you know, as the story goes, I've told many times it was it was, uh, it was kind of an accident that I actually started playing the trombone. I was uh, as a child growing up in the deep south. I was really involved in little league baseball and football, and you know, all things sports, and didn't had not really considered music. I'm not really from a family that has a focus on music. But I showed it one day in fifth grade, and my, my, my buddy and I were standing there waiting to get into school, and we saw a sign that said, uh, 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 Band Instrument Trial Day. And uh, I thought, what's that? And my buddy said, well, let's go check it out. So uh, we walked into this room where uh, uh, typically uh, a, a music dealer had all of the different instruments set up in the room, and you could go around these little pods and try the different instruments. And the trombone was... Uh, you know, I was immediately uh, taken with the sound of that instrument and said, hey, I want to do that. That looks kind of fun. And uh, uh, that, that's kind of how it began and quite by accident. And, I, you know, it's, it's amazing to think that the trajectory of somebody's life can change, I mean, really dramatically just by a, a chance happening. And that's exactly how it was for me. And uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I played uh, for one year in fifth grade in LaGrange, Georgia. We moved to Noonan, Georgia. And, uh, uh, you know, in Noonan, I, I had great band directors. Uh, uh, my jazz band director was a guy named Mariano Pacetti. I don't know if Mariano's still doing instrument repair work in the Atlanta area, but Mariano Pacetti was, uh, my, uh, was a j he jazz saxophone player that had spent a lot of his career in Las Vegas playing, playing jazz and married a lady that got a job at CNN in Atlanta, so they moved to Georgia of all places. Uh, Mar and Mariano is a funny guy. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to tell the story, no, but uh, sure. Pacetti grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and you can go on YouTube and look at this video. Uh, he, his nickname when he was in high school was Mushmouth Mariano because he uh, would go on television for the morning show in Cleveland, Ohio, and, and challenge different people the pizza eating contest and even challenged the dog to a pizza eating contest one time on live television in Cleveland, Ohio. So a really colorful guy, uh, incredible jazz saxophone players. He was, uh, he was one of my band directors, uh, in Noonan, uh, Bill Lazenby, uh, who else? Uh, John Eldewan. Um, uh, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm probably leaving out some people, but Doug Moore, who went on to be the uh, the leader of the school system, uh, the superintendent of the school system in Noonan after after leaving band directing, but uh, had great band directors in Noonan. Uh, 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 my choral director was really great, uh, was very involved in the chorus, and that, that was kind of really the focus of my life in high school. Music, you know, I you know.
know, even though I was involved in sports early on, my body didn't quite develop in the way that most, uh, like every, all the other people did. So I was kind of small for my age and was getting kind of beat up playing football. And I just kind of moved away from that a little bit. And I'm glad I did because it's, uh, it opened up a real world of opportunities for me, and uh, I've got I've gotten to see the world, getting to meet a lot of different kinds of people, and uh, I've been very fortunate. But I, it all began in the deep south in small town Lagrange in Noonan, Georgia. Well, I know where Lagrange is. I'm actually teaching there in the fall, <laughs> starting to teach at the, the college there in the fall. Lagrange College, yeah. Yeah, yeah, small little program. So is it surrounded by magnolia trees still? I uh, it is. It is, and there's still a statue of Marquis de Lafayette in the town square. <laughs> yeah. So, um, now, did you take trombone lessons when you were in high school? You know, that's, uh, that's a good question, and the answer is I did not. You know, uh, I have a very strange background in that way. I, I honestly, I, I did not take lessons growing up. There really wasn't. It's not like how it is now in Georgia where there are a lot of very qualified teachers on every instrument everywhere. I mean, there just weren't that many teachers around back. This would be the, uh, I guess I moved to Newton in 1980. So it would be the early 80s, early to, to mid to late 80s. There weren't that many teachers around. Uh, so I did not have lessons with a, a real trombone player. My band directors kind of taught me what they could about the trombone. They really were not, uh, uh, they weren't trombone players. So, I mean, they couldn't give me a lot of like professional level insight. My first real trombone lesson was when I got to Jacksonville State University in Jacksonville, Alabama. And uh, I, you know, once again, kind of on a, a whim, I drove over to Jacksonville and, and played and auditioned for a scholarship to go to school there. I wanted to be a band director. And uh, so involved in band in high school, that, that's what I kind of wanted my folks to be in college. So JSU was kind of the place where everybody attended from my college if you wanted to go into music ed. So uh, I got there, received a scholarship, and my first real trauma lesson was with Jim Roberts. He's retired a few years back, and uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of insight about that program at the time, it was Jacksonville State University, a, kind of a, a small school, I think it's had 7,500 students at the time, was staffed with a lot of people from places outside of the Deep South, uh, many who had uh, served in military bands, and uh, really great music faculty and it was there with Jim Roberts that was my very first trombone lesson wow yeah, that's a, that's amazing especially considering how far you come obviously with your career did you listen to a lot of music growing up or were you just kind of playing in bands and doing what you were doing honestly no I, I really did it and I you know I tell my students these days that I mean with with YouTube and the internet and all of the resources that are available just right there in the palm of your hand it was a very different time in the early 80s. You know, uh, this was pre-internet. This was pre-YouTube. You know, my again, my we didn't have a big, we didn't have a record collection in my family. I didn't really listen to a lot of classical music. Well, I, I mean, I listened to quite a bit of, uh, I, had, I had some jazz records. I listened to every J.J. Johnson album I could get a hold of and lots of Bob Mincer and, uh, uh, you know, lots, lots of, uh, this guy Mariano Vichetti made that stuff available to us. But, you know, Nothing that I, I would say, I would say almost nothing that I did early on in life would indicate that I would wind up as a member of the Metropolitan Opera or teaching at Indiana University. I mean, it's, uh, so no, I, I really didn't. It, it wasn't until I got to college and started to get into the library at our college. And, you know, uh, one interesting story I'll say is that uh, my very first lesson with Jim Roberts, my trombone teacher at Jacksonville State University, he threw on a record of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra playing pictures at an exhibition. And, you know, I'm just, it, it, I mean, for anybody that's out there listening that doesn't remember the 1980s, you know, uh, th that was really the, that was my first classical recording that I listened to. And it was, it, it blew my mind, really. I, you know, I heard this recording. I said, whoa, what is that piece? What's that sound? It was Bud Hurst, of yeah. course, playing the opening. And, and uh, my teacher, he explained what it was, and uh, that was kind of that kind of got the ball rolling uh, with us having a conversation about uh, uh, what it, what it what it means to have a career as a professional playing musician. Like I said, when I got to college, my my focus was to be a band director. You know, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, but uh, he he introduced me to classical music. He kind of explained the process of taking auditions and. 
introduced me to things like orchestral excerpts and explained what how to prepare them and what this process was like and I thought wow I'm I'm going to really try this even though I was a music ed major I really uh dedicated myself to learning orchestral excerpts and uh honing the craft to take an audition and I actually won my first audition with one semester left of my music ed degree so I wound up I actually wound up doing my student teaching in Iowa because I uh with that one semester left I won uh, the uh the bass drum own position with the uh, what was then the Cedar Rapids Symphony in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Now it's Orchestra, Iowa. But, uh, yeah, so. And is that how you wound up going to graduate school in Iowa? That is exactly how I got there. And it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, several of the faculty members at Jacksonville State University in Alabama had attended the University of Iowa for grad school. And I would kind of heard the name of that school. But honestly, I, it really wasn't my intention to go there. I, I mean, Iowa might as well have been the moon for me. You know, I'd never been to Iowa. You know, it took me, uh, it took me 10, 10 or 12 hours to drive to Iowa to take the audition. It seemed like, I mean, it seemed like the other side of planet Earth, really. But uh, I won this job in, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I, uh, uh, you know, I was, I also, when I, I was serving as the bass drum player of the orchestra, they had, uh, they had job openings for the orchestra librarian and the secretary for the Suzuki school that they were running uh, alongside the orchestra. I managed to get those little jobs to kind of go along on the side to make a little money. And uh, I did my student teaching in Cedar Rapids. And after that, it just kind of seemed like a natural, uh, kind of the natural thing to do to try to do a master's degree. And uh, so that's, that's how I started school there. I studied with, uh, I had three teachers. Actually, I, I studied with a lot of people while I was at Iowa because they had a trombone search there. So while I was at the University of Iowa over uh, different periods of time, I studied with a guy named John Hill, who was a very respected teacher at the time. A guy named George Krim, who was an amazing trombone player. He was the principal of the Canadian Broadcast Symphony Orchestra. David Gear eventually got there, who's the dean of the School of Music at University of Michigan now. But uh, also along that lines, there was a guy named David Johansson, who te I think he teaches down in Louisiana right now. And this guy named Brad Edwards, who uh, yeah. He's written a few books that we all know. Brad Edwards uh, also taught there for a little bit while I was there. So I had a lot of exposure to a lot of players while I was at the uh, University of Iowa. And it, I was, I, I, you know, proximity to Chicago was also a very good thing for me because uh, uh, while I was in school at the University of Iowa, I was actually there twice. And that's kind of, I know I'm rambling here, but. No, no, no. This is, I was, what, yeah. I was, you know, I was in school. Uh, I was in school in Iowa one time for two years for my master's degree. My wife and I left there. We went on the road with an Andrew Lloyd Webber show. We toured with an Andrew Lloyd Webber show for two years. And then after the show ended, we went back to Iowa for three years where I completed my doctorate. And uh, during the, the second period of time in Iowa is when I, when I started driving over to Chicago. I, I got into Chicago Civic Orchestra played in that orchestra for two years, uh, started studying with members of the Chicago Symphony, also won the Illinois Symphony Orchestra job. And uh, so it, there, there was a time in my life, and I think back on this, and I, don't, I do not know how I survived this, but there was a time in my life where I was completing my doctorate at the University of Iowa, playing in the Chicago Civic Orchestra, driving down to, to uh, uh, Spring, Springfield, Illinois, as I remember, the Illinois Symphony Orchestra, and also playing in the Cedar Rapids Symphony. So... That was a very busy time, and all I remember, uh, the biggest thing I remember, I, I'll say, is driving through uh, raging snowstorms on, you know, just trying to get from one orchestra to the next and trying to complete my paper and doing all this stuff. It was, it was an amazing time. Iowa was very, it was a very good uh, school for me. That must have been great preparation for your current lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, really, truly, it, it, it was, you know, having to be organized to juggle a schedule that included three, playing in, again, three different places and uh, doing a doctoral degree and serving as the TA at the time, that, you know, having to be that organized to do all that stuff, it, it really did help me be organized for what I've been doing over the past couple of years, which is kind of, uh, you know, I have the dual role of being a member of the Met Orchestra and a, a full-time tenured faculty member at uh, Indiana University. So organization, the organization to be able to do that, I, I learned from that time in my life. I would say so. And you had a lot of interest, too, because you've, you've talked about the jazz interest you had growing up. And then while you were at Iowa, you were also 
an assistant in musicology. Did I read that right? Yeah, you know, uh, again, I was I was in I was at the University of Iowa I think for a total of five maybe six years, and over the course of those two two periods of time, like I said, I was uh, I uh, I served for the first year. I was my first TA position was TA with. Uh, 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 the musicology area, and I, I helped with one of the music history classes that te uh, that teaches to non majors. So I, it was one of those classes that has 200 kids in it, and you know it's it's an elective for them. But uh, I helped grade papers and just kind of helped do different things for that for that class. So that was my first DA position. Uh, when I left for the two years and came back, you know, for those two years that I was on the road with the Andrew Lloyd Weber show. I was surrounded by jazz musicians. The rest of the guys on the show, they were all jazz musicians that had played with all of the big band, the great big bands, you know, uh, uh, Woody Herman, Stan Kitten, Buddy Rich. You know, I was surrounded by musicians who had experience with that. And so I get off the road, I go back to Iowa, and, you know, I'm, my focus has kind of been commercial playing. So I, be, I was the jazz TA for a while there and, and helped out with the jazz program, directed one of the jazz bands. But, I mean, eventually, I, w I really kind of wanted to be the trombone TA, you know. So right at the end of my degree, my doctoral degree, I finally became the trombone TA and got to teach some trombone lessons and help out with the trombone area. But uh, my my dissertation, uh, you know, what, what I don't know if I don't know if you have a, a terminal degree, but one of the big hurdles that everybody has to overcome for that that doctorate is is a topic to write on. Because right. for most programs, you have to write a paper. And uh, my paper wrote itself because I, you know, uh, right at the beginning of the degree, I knew that I wanted to write on the history of the bass trombone in big band jazz. And uh, again, I, I, I just coming off the road with a whole bunch of players that had stories out the wazoo. And, you know, after meeting people in different cities for the last two years of playing, the paper wrote itself, really. And it was it was it was a really fun paper. It's really important. Yeah, I have a I have a doctor from Stony Brook actually, and and you know, ah. the, and I'm sure you would say the same advice to anybody that gets a doctorate when you come to that hurdle. Make sure it's on something you are interested in. Absolutely. I mean, if uh, I mean, with my prospective doctoral students now at Indiana University, one of the conversations that I have with people right up front is, look, you know. It would be great if you don't wait till the end of your coursework to start thinking about your topic. You you need to start wrapping your head around something that you have a passion for, something that you're going to be, uh, th something that's not going to be torture for you to spend hours writing and researching and doing interviews on because, uh, you know, it's it, it can be either, be either be a pleasant experience or be torture. And I was fortunate; it was very pleasant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, your incoming colleague Kevin Cobb was my teacher at Stony Brook. And and uh, I remember discussing that with Kevin, and I was gonna. I said, "Well, I could do it on this particular sonata." He said, "Why would you ever want to do that?" <laughs> it was it was good advice. It was good advice. So you know, so you, when you were developing, then so you got to college at Jacksonville State, and I'm it, I'm sure you were an absolute sponge as a student. You know, were you already a bass trombone player at that point, or you were a tenor player, or when did that switch happen? I was a ten when I first got to school at Jacksonville State University as a music ed major. I was a tenor trombone player, uh, and uh, I got I got there and the jazz band again. Very fortunate at Jacksonville State University. I had an incredible jazz director named Ron Serace, and Ron Serace had been played piano. He toured with Stan Kenton as Stan's piano player for a long time, and incredible musician composer. And he needed a bass trombone player in the jazz band, and Jacksonville State University had a bass trombone. I'd never played bass trombone. I didn't know what this instrument was, but I said, sure, I'm a freshman. I want to play in the jazz band. This is the way I'm going to be able to do it. So I checked out the instrument and started playing uh, bass trombone in the jazz band and uh, eventually did some other work and other ensembles on it. So I, I kind of developed the ability to play both, at a, I guess, at a fairly high level. And... That honestly is, by the way, and there's something else I did during this time. I want, I just, I have to mention because it, 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 it was, it was crucial for something that happened to me later on. But also during this time, during that, that time at Jacksonville State University as a music ed major, mm -hmm. I took a year off and marched drum corps. I moved to San Francisco, California, and marched, marched with the Blue Devils 
in, in San Francisco, out to Concord, really Concord, California, and learn how to play valves really well. And uh, so, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the word sponge, I guess, would apply to uh, how I was as an undergrad. I, I really learned, I really wanted to learn how to do as much as I could. And uh, uh, it wasn't actually, I didn't, I didn't really move to focusing on bass trombone only until I was on the show with the Andrew Lloyd Webber show. And the way the way that happened was uh, I was originally contacted to play this this touring show uh, as someone that doubled on bass and tenor trombone. It was going to be a two trombone show. One guy played lead trombone, and then I would play tenor and, and double on bass. And so I got to the show that uh, it we it took us four weeks to kind of get the show up and going, and I got to the first rehearsal, which was in Louisville. You mentioned Louisville earlier when we were talking. Mm-hmm. First rehearsal was in Louisville, Kentucky. That's they rented out a, a, a theater and we put the show up there. And it there was some kind of last minute they decided to hire a second tenor trombone to kind of have a full trombone section, and so I became just the bass trombone player on the show. And uh. Over the course of the two years of touring with this show, we, we played a different city each week. I What I would do while I was on the show was we'd get to a new city, and uh, if there was a union in the city, I would I would call the union and get as many, the names of the trombone players in the local orchestra, or just figure out who was in this city that I could take a lesson with. And over the course of those two years, I, I mean, it would not be an exaggeration to say I, I took hundreds of lessons, you know, wow. uh, with every every name player that I could, that would answer my phone call, really, and uh, and they were all on bass trombone at that time. So that's that was kind of the reason why I moved from being a tenor trombone player to a bass trombone player. It was it was that show just kind of pushed me into that that role. That's really phenomenal. How every little event has caused you to be ready for where you are now, right? Just the trombone start, then the you know. The, all the driving around, the way you switch to bass trombone, and then actually being in a in a pit for a long time, so you, it wasn't like such probably as much of an adjustment for you to be in an opera orchestra in that way. Well, right? it yeah, you know, uh, the biggest surprise about uh, uh, getting to New York, find, you know, everybody's. I mean, many people's goal is to, to land a job in one of the Lincoln Center orchestras, right? You know. Uh, get, the neon lights of Broadway, you know, it's, it's well chronicled how that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, every, every, every musician kind of wants to be in New York at some point in their life. And one of the big surprises for me after finally getting to New York, I win the bass trombone position at the Metropolitan Opera and I get there and I realize that my role is not just bass trombone. I, uh, really what, what my job was going to be was the Vexel, uh, out in Europe, they call it the Vexel position. Vexel means switching in German. So I get to New York and uh, I am I'm suddenly the the guy that plays both bass and tenor trombone as needed. There was another uh, another guy in the section named Stephen Norell, also from Georgia, I would say, from Carrollton, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Ironically, uh, I, I grew up five minutes from where my colleague in the Met uh, was from. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I, I get to New York and uh, I'm switching on bass and tenor quite a bit, but the other thing that happened, and I mentioned drum corps, and the reason why I wanted to mention that, learning vowels, was that right about the time I got to New York City, the Met had committed to a new, a brand new production of uh, the Ring Cycle. They decided to replace uh, the old uh, 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 Otto Schenk production of the Ring Cycle with a new production uh, by this guy named Robert Lopage, who was one of the founders of Cirque du Soleil. And it was going to be a huge deal, HD video, you know, all this stuff. And uh, James Levine was looking for a new person. He wanted somebody new to play the bass trumpet. And I, they, he asked, he said, do, do you play valves? And I said, well, I, I, I have in the past. I haven't played bass trumpet on the ring cycle, but I'll learn it, you know. And so that's kind of how I, I mean, I started, I've, I've played bass trumpet on the ring cycle now, I mean, many, 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 many times. And, uh, I, you know, you mentioned little things, little things that I've experienced in my life leading up to being in New York and playing in the Met. Drum Corps, you know, blasting away on a bugle in drum corps really prepared me for, you know, being able to play bass trumpet on the ring cycle, which I think I'll say is one of the most glorious things a low brass player can ever do, you know. 
playing the ring cycle in any chair is 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 a wonderful thing to be able to do. But the bass trumpet part in the in the ring cycle is is it's 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 the greatest thing I've ever done, really. Wow, wow, that's really cool. I mean, what a is that? That's the production that was a little bit controversial at the at first, right? Because all the sets were very modern and and new, if I remember that correctly. It was not everybody. Not everybody really really liked that production and uh you know i'll be the first to admit that critically i'll say that a lot of the new productions that are happening at the met are not as great as the older productions uh you know uh but i personally i i like the production if if you've uh, if you've watched the the dvd of that production of the ring cycle it it's amazing lots of really great close-ups of the singers the uh the production is designed around this this machine that has fingers that can be manipulated in different ways. Wow. Oh. Are you free? Am I freezing? Shoot. Oh shit. Paul, are you there? The things on. I'm sorry, I froze up a little you know, bit. You uh, know, that's okay. Can you can you hear me? I've got you. I was worried that might happen. My internet's been, it's not as rural as it sounds like it could be in Georgia, right? <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't expect this. You were talking about the, uh, the way it was manipulated, that, that production. Yeah, you know, it, it, it was designed around a machine that was a little bit complicated. And uh, it, it would it would it broke down a couple of times here and there. So pe people were kind of critical of it. It also cost a lot of money to do. It was very heavy. That actually uh, it required it required that the whole stage of the Metropolitan Opera be reinforced because it was so heavy. So the uh, the summer before the the production uh, the new production, our locker everything below the stage was closed because they were having to reinforce the, the the stage with steel beams to hold up this thing so it was really expensive and you know but uh i i like i liked it you know like i said if you watch the the, the dvd of the production it is it's really interesting to watch and um you know to be a part of to, uh, again on bass trumpet and to be a part of a new production of what many people regard is the greatest art, artistic achievement of all time, the ring cycle. Right. It was just a very, very special time. And, you know, it's, you know, playing, playing is not many people in the world can play the bass trumpet on the ring cycle. I mean, it's, it's a very tricky thing. There, there are lots of places where uh, you make or break the show. You know, there, there are several moments in the ring cycle where if you, if you don't, if you don't play this, this solo well, that is the thing people are going to remember when they walk out of the, the door. So it's it's a very important part. It's very tricky. Not pe many people in the world can do it. I, I actually play poker w online with a guy a guy from Washington, Doug Rosenthal, who uh, is another person that's played the ring cycle a lot. You know, and ironically, I'm on faculty here at IU. Even though my role here at IU is to teach bass trombone only, my colleague Carl Lenthe is another person who has played bass trumpet on the ring cycle in Europe for many decades. So, but it's a very special thing. And uh, it, I, the reason why a, a kid from a small town in Georgia was able to be able to do that in New York was because of drum corps, I'll say. Wow. <laughs> now was the, was the bass trombone, uh, was that part of the job description when you applied it? You had to have played the ring cycle on bass trumpet. Since no, I both done it. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah no, I, you know, here at IU, I, I try to downplay any of that other stuff. When I when, when I'm in Bloomington, I'm a bass drummer player. You know, right. Carl, Carl and Pete, Pete Ellison. Uh, they're, they're anytime somebody calls me for a lesson, if they want to, if they want to talk about bass drum, if they want to talk about tenor trombone, I steer them in that direction. You know, and that keeps my life simple here. It's it's ri you know honestly in New York, living in New York, having having to. Uh, keep all of those instruments happening at a high level, having a life that's complicated, that, that's that complicated, it's very nice to just exist in Bloomington as the bass trombone teacher. I, I, it's, it's nice. Now, is Bloomington where you are primarily right now as a residence, or, or are you still I in mean, York? No, I'm, I'm in Bloomington right now. I, you know, I've been here since March. Uh, I, I, 
like many people in our business, I went from uh, from 200 miles an hour. I was flying back and forth between uh, Indiana and New York City sometimes three, four times a week. Uh, I went from doing that to boom, March. I think it was March 16th. I got I flew back to Bloomington from New York. I had not. I left. I mean, my locker, my apartment, everything is just was just left there and I did not go back until a couple of weeks ago really uh so I was I've been in the quarantine here in in Bloomington and my family my family's here in Bloomington okay okay yeah it's a much easier place for a family lifestyle in Bloomington than it is a lot of stuff that comes with New York yeah my my kids have uh my kids have a you know I I don't want to say traditional but they they're having a high school experience that's that's a little bit more like what I had growing up in Georgia with you know, with a big school, with a football team, and with pep bands and marching band and orchestra and band, all that stuff. And also, uh, they're going to go. They're going to get to attend IU, which which is a nice perk for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and before you and before you were in the Met, you were also in Hong Kong, right? And and uh, the Finnish Radio Symphony for a year, right? Can you talk about those two jobs a little bit? Yeah, you know. Um, let me, I just want to get the timeline straight here. Um, so, and I know this is, this is all very complicated, but it's, it really is true. Uh, at the end of my doctorate, and this would have been, this would have been uh, 2000, uh, right at the end of my doctorate, I, I auditioned for the Hong Kong Philharmonic. I, again, like I said, I was playing in the Chicago Civic Orchestra. The Hong Kong Philharmonic had, uh, they, at that time, they had regional auditions all over the world. If they had a position open, they did, an, they did an audition in London, Paris, Hong Kong, Chicago, and New York. They just sent their, their representatives to, to, to audition in these different places. And um, at that time, at the end of my degree, I was applying for college teaching positions and taking, taking any auditions that were around. And uh, so uh, Hong Kong was auditioning in Chicago on a day that I was there playing with Civic. So I just went down the street, played the audition for the Hong Kong Philharmonic. Uh, and they wound up offered, uh, offering me that job at the same time that I was offered a tenure track teaching position at the University of Northern Iowa. And uh, at the time, the Hong Kong Philharmonic job was a one-year sub position. The, the, the University of Northern Iowa position was a tenure track teaching position with benefits, all that stuff. And I couldn't turn down the the UNI job. So I told the people of the Hong Kong Philharmonic, I said, look, I really want to come there and play, but I can't turn down this other job that I have that is, that is full-time and it's, it's going to be long-term. If the position in Hong Kong uh, becomes a full-time position, I would really be interested and I would, I would love to come play. And so what happened was we moved to Cedar Falls, Iowa. I take this job, my wife and I, I should say, and uh, halfway through that first school year, it must have been around December, the Hong Kong Philharmonic, they sent me a message and said, our job is, has become open as a full-time position. The person that was on sabbatical, his name was Phil Brink. He's not coming back. Would you be interested in taking the job? And, you know, of course, I wanted to play, you know. Uh, and so I went to the dean of University of Northern Iowa, and I said, his name was Dean Lubker. I said, Dean Lubker, I've been offered this playing position in Hong Kong. I really want to take it and, and because Dean Lubker had also done something similar while he was teaching. He, went, he did a sabbatical in, in Europe, and uh, he said, yes, go play the position for one year, but just come back. That's all we want. So my wife and I, we rented out our house. We moved to Hong Kong, and we fell in love with the place. I, you know, we couldn't leave, I, and – uh, it, it was, it's a fascinating, it's my favorite city in the world, which is a, a strong statement having lived in New York for a decade. I think Hong Kong is one of the most fascinating cities in the world. And we fell in love with it. My job, my, uh, my job was great with the Hong Kong Philharmonic. My, my wife had a really great teacher, uh, teaching position at one of the local uh, international schools. And we couldn't leave and wound up spending six years of our life there. Both of my children were, bor- were born there. Uh, and, uh, uh, I never, honestly, I never thought I would leave Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, like I said, after, uh, after six years of being there, uh, during, I think it was during my sixth year, both the New York Philharmonic and the Metropolitan Opera had bass trombone openings. And again, I had no, I, I really wasn't thinking towards coming back to the United States. We were really happy in Hong Kong, but 
you know, I just thought to myself, you know, this is this is a once in a life, lifetime opportunity. Two Lincoln Center orchestras have bass drum own positions. I've got to at least just try. I'm going to regret it, you know, when I'm sitting in my rocking chair uh, as a retiree. I'm going to regret not not at least trying to do this. And so um, I wound up I wound up flying to New York for the New York Philharmonic audition happened first, and I flew to New York, played the preliminary round. Got got through somehow, you know. I was jet lagged as heck, and uh, went, flew back to Hong Kong, and uh, like three or four weeks later, flew back to New York and got into the final round of the New York Philharmonic job, and got to the finals with. Uh, uh, I was in the finals with one of my heroes, J James Markey, who's now the bass drum owner to the Boston Symphony Orchestra, but uh, he and I were in the finals, and you know, Jim Markey's a, a, a phenom on the bass drum own, and. He had worked with Lauren Mazel previously, who was the director at the time of the New York Philharmonic, and everybody loved Jim. Uh, and he's, I would have hired him too. So they hired, they hired Jim. I was devastated, honestly. Uh, I, it was my dream to play in the New York Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. I'd gotten really close, and uh, I, I was devastated. And I got, I flew back to Hong Kong, and uh, the Met was six, going to be six weeks later. And I just told my wife, I said. I do not want to fly back to New York. This is emotionally too draining. I spent all that time. I got so close. We're happy in Hong Kong. Let's, I, don't, I don't want to do this again. And she just wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, she said, I have, I have a feeling. I, I really think you should just work on these excerpts. Just take this one last audition. I, I kind of have a feeling about this. And I did, and it worked out. I, I won the job at the Met. And right. so we moved our family to New York City. And we're there for just kind of continuous conversation about international playing experience. We're in New York for, I'm not sure where it happened in the course of my, but five, six or seven years we're in New York. And uh, uh, the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra had a bass drum own position open. And uh, what, their American principal trombone player is a guy named Darren Acosta, mm -hmm. who, who uh, played in Boston for a long time. And, had gotten that job and he reached out about about their list their audition list he wanted to just kind of run the the excerpts by me and just ask are the do you, do you think this is a typical list is this is this going to be uh something that's that's good for the auditioners and we started talking about what life was like in finland and you know uh it, i was fascinated by what he was telling me and i offhandedly i said wow maybe i should take this audition it sounds pretty cool over there and and he said well if you're serious if you're serious the, the deadline is not closed and we could even have you over to play for a couple of weeks it, leading up to the audition just to see just to see if you fit with the orchestra and if you like the, the the country and Helsinki and I said sure let's do this let's see what happens and so I went there I played with the orchestra for two weeks uh at the end of the two weeks took the audition and and won the audition and Got back to America, talked to my wife, and, and we decided, you know what, we've got to do this. My wife is a school teacher, by the way, and it was an incredible opportunity for her to observe what uh, uh, a system, an education system that's been lauded all over the world as being one of the most progressive and healthy education systems in the world, the Finnish education system. And so we decided to do that, and uh, we picked up our family, um, uh, and uh, – yeah, moved to Helsinki, and my kids, my my kids went to school in in a Finnish school. My wife took Finnish uh, language lessons, and uh, it was a fascinating year. We love we love Finland. Uh, it, it's uh, the the people were uh, they're not like Americans. They're quiet, but uh, thinkers and really creative, and they invest a lot of money in the arts. That uh, they pronounce his. I have to I have to preface this by saying they pronounce his name Sibelius there. Because Americans think I'm crazy, I don't know how to pronounce that name. In Finnish, every first syllable of a word is is emphasized. So if I say "terve uh, mitakulu," which means "good morning, how are you?" "terve mitakulu," so you say "Sibelius." So Sibelius is one of the national heroes of Finland, and uh, so they invest a lot of money and energy in into the arts. And so I get to Finland. There's a brand new hall. Uh, most of our concerts are broadcast live on national television. The, the I, I don't think I ever saw an empty seat for a concert, uh, and we loved, loved it there. But we just 
it was just really hard for me at that moment in my life as someone who had grown up in America to just just give it all away to to stay there. I just couldn't do it. So uh, we we came back, and so, but that that's why we were in Hell City. Gotcha. Okay. And then and then you wind up having this dual position at IU. And, you know, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about how you manage that back and forth? Like when things are in full swing, how, how often are you in the air? You know, uh, as, as I was saying, I, uh, before, before the, the COVID uh, situation hit America and we had to be quarantined, uh, uh, I, was fought, I was in the air at least four times a week, you know, at least two round trips a week, uh, which, which sounds worse than it actually is, you know, uh, I live I live about 50 minutes from the Indianapolis airport. The Indianapolis airport is is ranked as one of the best airports in America. It's it's uh, super efficient. It from curb to gate. I'm I, every morning. I curb to gate is 10 minutes. I get uh, dropped off at the curb. I'm at my gate through security at my gate in 10 minutes. The flight to New York is an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, and then to get from the from the airport to to Lincoln Center is another, you know, depending on the trains and stuff like that, could be another 30, half hour to an hour, depending on that. I sleep really well on airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, both, I'm for, the only way I can do this is that both jobs have a lot of flexibility. You know, uh, but the Metropolitan Opera contract is that we're, we have, even though there are seven operas per week, we're contracted to play four of those operas per week. And so, there's a lot of flexibility there. I can kind of pick and choose the operas I, I, I need to play according to schedule. And, you know, uh, I'm, I make sure that my students are uh, uh, well served and get a lot of face time um, at, at IU, you know. And again, as I said, I think we were talking maybe at the beginning, it's about being organized. You know, I have three Google calendars that are kind of stacked on top of each other, one with my one with my family schedule, one with my Met schedule, and one with my IU schedule. And I just make sure that all of that kind of stays together. And, uh, you know, it, it works out really, you know, but I, you know, I have some friends that get really nervous about flying and have to take, get medicated before they fly and all that stuff. You know, I'm fortunate. And again, probably because I've, I basically spent my career just traveling a lot, but I, I get on an airplane and I fall asleep like that. I'm telling you, as soon as my head hits an airplane seat, I am asleep. And you know, that's that's kind of how I'm able to do it, really. I'm, and I hope I, I'm able to do it in the future. Who knows what's going to happen with the performing arts coming out of this, really? Yeah, yeah, no doubt about that. Um, and that that brings me to a couple. I mean, there were there were a couple things I wanted to hit um, is, is for for students, but but I did want to talk about that a little bit, especially now. How you're dealing with teaching with COVID? What's I mean, John and I talked about this. John Rommel and I talked about this last week, a little bit on here. And how are you dealing with the, the online teaching? Is it like a normal lesson, or your students were pre-recording stuff and sending it, or how are you handling that? You know, I have a hybrid uh, hybrid approach to to teaching uh, via Zoom. Uh, some students want to send in a recording have me talk about it, uh, uh, send them notes, uh, have, have me listen to their recording, send them notes about my observations, and then we meet again after that, have some students that just want to meet in person. Uh, I, you know, I had some students who decided, you know what, and I gave them this option, uh, I, don't, I don't really like this system, I'm just going to wait until we can meet person person again, and then we'll have a couple of extra lessons then. So uh, my approach was to be as, as flexible as possible for the students and uh, that seemed to work very well. Uh, I can tell you this, by the time that the quarant we had to be quarantined in my studio at IU, we had a significant amount of stuff already accomplished for the semester. The week before the, week before the quarantine happened, we had our studio recital. At that recital, all of my students played opera arias. I'd assigned each one of them an opera aria mm -hmm. to play on trombone. So we had, we'd had that done. And uh, I mean, a lot, most of the meaningful work was done, but uh, yeah, you know, this, I, I mean, for any, I know anybody that's doing this a lot would say it, this is not ideal. It's hard to play duets with your students on yeah. with Zoom lessons. I would start every lesson with a duet with my students under normal conditions. But uh, so, I mean, you got to have good microphone. You got to have, got to be technology savvy for sure. But uh, 
you know, one of the things that I mean, one of the things I think is a real positive that's come from from this is, you know, the ability to do what we're doing right now. You know, this kind of thing, this kind of uh, sharing of knowledge and these kinds of interviews and uh, didn't really happen that 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 often before before COVID. And you know, one of the things that I did the very last semester of school was I talked to some of my buddies, my bass drum old player buddies, and uh, I did swap zoom master classes for the whole last week of school and i did a series of i probably did six or seven master classes for different people at different schools around the united states where, where they had a few students of theirs play for me and vice versa and that was an incredible opportunity for my students to hear hear teachers that they normally would not have probably had contact with and it I, that that's a real positive for sure I had to put myself on mute because my, my dog's looking at me like he needs something. <laughs> Give me one second. Just, That's uh, okay. Intermission. Hang on one second. Hello, everybody who's uh, on the chat. Sarah Altman, William Brown, Holly Pritchard. Hello, I hope you guys are doing well. I, if you uh, if you want to send the let's see Sorry, here. I also, a power, I also needed a power cord, so I was like uh, dual purpose. So uh, okay. so yeah, you're right. The this time with the COVID, it's these kind of things are going on all the time, and and uh, it it seemed to me like at the beginning there was a rush of a lot of people doing a lot of stuff, and then there was like a decline, and now we're sort of in it for the long haul. I think. You know, yeah, uh, you know, uh, the the overdub projects that have uh, that are happening quite a bit. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's great. I mean, I think it's great that that people are wanting to produce art and be creative and find find ways to be creative to to work through this time, really. And I think we all need to be doing that, you know, because I, you know, people need to be I think the, the public needs to be reminded that, hey, live music and and is is important and um uh we need an audience when when this all uh when we find a vaccine and we're able to go back to doing what we do as as performing musicians for sure uh, uh let's see somebody i, I, I while you're gone i looked at the chat let's oh yeah holly, uh, uh holly holly pritchard is a great trombone player in atlanta and she has some students watching and i know she wants to ask a question uh and i see sarah Altman is a fine horn player and trumpet player. And uh, she says, um, oh, okay, she's talking about some of the music ed students and they have huge dreams. What do you think they can be doing while they are there to keep dreaming and working and maybe achieve what they want? I think, I think where she's going a little bit is probably, that's a really strong music ed school, right? And so when you're at a school that maybe isn't quite as much of a performance as like IU or Eastman or something like that, can you maybe talk a little bit about like what was going through your head as a, a younger player? Well, you know, one of the things that, uh, first of all, let me say, one of the things that I did as an undergrad, the decision that I made as an undergrad that I have, I'm so happy that I did was I, I was a music ed major, you know, I, I, you know, I was a music ed major at Jacksonville State University uh, with the mindset that I, I want to perform and I'm going to work really hard to try to, again, like I discussed before, win an audition so I can play pieces like picture at, pictures at an exhibition. I want to be able to do that. But at the same time, uh, I want I want to have a varied skill set. I want to be able to have teaching concepts and, you know, I want to be able to do what I need to do to make my way in the music world. And as we all know, uh, it's, it is quite difficult to win an audition to, to be a professional player. Not many people are fortunate enough to be able to do that. And, you know, so when I was at Jacksonville State University, I was a music ed major. I was fully, I was fully committed to learning all those things I needed to learn to be a good educator. But at the same time, I was practicing a lot. I, there wasn't a lot. There wasn't a lot of wasted time, and you know, it hurt. Just to kind of answer uh, Sarah's question, uh, I would 
If I were a student at Jacksonville State University, if I were a music ed student right now at Jacksonville State University with dreams of being a professional player, I would be fully committed to learning as much as I could about as many things as I could during that time and just see where your career takes you. You know, I mean, I, I, there's no way I could have predicted my life when I was a music ed student at Jacksonville State University, yet all of the things that I was learning and and doing while I was there kind of propelled me into these different facets of my career. So uh, I would just try to soak it all up, just try to learn as much as you can, take advantage of as many opportunities you get. Uh, don't be afraid to fail. You know, one of the things I tell my students quite a bit is that, uh, you know, uh, every every time you fail, you learn something and move closer to achieving your dream. And I, I mean, there's almost nobody that I know in the music business that hasn't hasn't failed a lot before they achieved what they want to do. I mean, I have a colleague in the Metropolitan Opera, Ray Riccomeni, who is a trumpet player. Ray, I think Ray took 100 auditions before he won his job in the Metropolitan Opera. You know, at the same time, I have colleagues who were 18 years old when they won their job in the Met, you know. But so you, you, you never know when the lightning is going to strike for you. It may never strike. You never know. And it's important to just prepare yourself, your skill set for being – uh, for being able to do whatever you need to do to have a career in this business. And that's exactly what I would do if I were a music student right now. You know, uh, one of the things that we have at IU, I'm going to mention this really fast before we move on from this topic. Uh, one of the degree programs we have here, I'm not sure if they had it when you were here, Mark, but we have a degree program called the, the BSOF degree. And yes. that stands for Bachelor of Science with, a, with an Outside Field. And basically what that is, uh, is they offer a degree track here where you can be a music performer but also pursue a, a, a degree program outside of music, whether it be in at the Kelly School of Business or accounting or pre-med or uh, recording engineering or – I mean, they're just there, – there are hundreds of options for doing that. And my, my person – not everybody agrees with me on this. I've had, I've had lots of discussions with teachers that don't agree on this, but – I just think because of the uncertainty of these times for the arts and for music, I, I'm, I'm passionate about people still pursuing the arts. The arts are important. Uh, uh, being creative, creativity is important. But I, I just think it's smart to, if you can go to a, a school where you can pursue your, your love of the arts, but at the same time, get a degree that is going to help you be an adult if you need to, you know, mm -hmm. That's a smart move, in my opinion. You know, if I mean, really, you know, if I could go to a school like IU and get a music performance degree and get an accounting degree at the same time or some other degree that would help me get a, a job if, if music is, is not happening for me, that is exactly what I would do. Well, and there's a lot of us, a lot of skills we need as musicians that we don't really realize until we get out, too. You just, you mentioned accounting. I mean, how we deal with our taxes or our finances or your you know, you're starting something in the music business that requires a, a thing on the side. I mean, that, that I didn't get it. I, I had a performance degree, but that BSOF, I knew a lot of guys that did that. And and they also played really well, I think, because they felt like some of the pressure was off sometimes. And it was... Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, always, I talk a lot about the fact that going into the auditions, you know, knowing that if, you know... There is, right, you're exactly right. Going into an audition knowing that if if you don't win the audition, even though you prepared as hard as you could, if you don't win the audition, you have other options in life. You know, that does that takes a lot of pressure off of, of you in, in a situation that's already uh, inherently very full of a lot of pressure, you know, very intense. Yeah, you having that music ed degree meant you knew you could always work, you know. In, in that way. And I have a passion for it. You know, it's uh, one of the one of the big uh, 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 discussions that happens sometimes in trombone forums is why should somebody pursue a music ed degree if they have zero passion for teaching? And I agree 100 percent. You know, uh, uh, I I didn't just get a music ed degree because it was uh, I, I felt like it's going to be a backup. I had a passion for education. and I, I had a passion for, you know, for music ed, you know, so it was it, that was a good thing for me. Yeah. And, and it sounds like, too, I mean, it helps, you know, a lot of times musicians, we can get a little bit uh, jaded. <laughs> and, 
And I think when people come at it where you are coming at it from, you're not, you don't get burned out as easy. You're more of a holistic person about music as opposed to, you know, just a straight, straight line into one thing where, where that is, that can get a little burned out sometimes. You know, uh, my, uh, uh, a friend of mine um, who is one of the greatest tenor trombone players of all time, Ian Bousfield, who was, uh, he was principal of the London Symphony Orchestra for a long time, and then he was in the principal of Vienna Philharmonic. Now he teaches in, uh, I think he teaches in Bern, Switzerland, I believe. But uh, he, he and I were talking one time about his, his students. And he said, it's funny, sometimes in the music business, the most successful people are the ones that are considered, the people that are considered to be the most successful are the ones that won an orchestra job, you know. But oftentimes, people that win an orchestra job and have to show up in the same place every day and see the same people every day and have the same routine are the most miserable. You know, it's the people that are happiest sometimes in the music business are the people that have careers that where they pl maybe play in a brass quintet a little bit, play in another kind of chamber ensemble, teach a little bit here, do some arranging work, you know, have, have a career that's maybe have a, a regional orchestra job where they get to play in a large ensemble a little bit here and there. Those people sometimes are way happier and way more fulfilled than someone that just sits in an orchestra every day and, uh, you know, just grows to be miserable by that situation, you know? So, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's funny you mentioned, uh, Ian, cause yeah, his podcasts are really great that he has coming out and he, he really smart guy. Yeah. He's really smart. He mentions that stuff a whole lot. You know, what, he, what you're talking about right there. I have a couple of questions. People, some folks are writing in. And by the way, if you watch these chats and uh, if you're putting stuff on Facebook and I don't always see it, it's because I'm not very good at going back and forth. So if you have a really good question, pop in on the, the Zoom chat and, and write it. But I do have a couple texts that uh, some folks have written in. Um, so uh, one of Holly's students, uh, William Brown, had a question um, for a very young budding ninth grade student or high school students. Can you give us your go-to books, literature, et cetera? For high school, early college, and definitely someone who was on track to playing bass and doubling professionally. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, uh, the the Bordoni etudes. I mean, I've got to throw those out there. Of course, those are uh, those are very that, those are very important etudes for trombone players. We play them as written down an octave, tenor clef. We do lots of octave transpositions with those those etudes. I've done those those my whole life, really. Uh, uh, I think those are very important. The Arbins, of course, if you if you want to uh, learn how to play rhythm correctly, uh, uh, very important to work through that book and just making sure that you you learn how to interpret all of those rhythms really, really, really well. Um, uh, let's see here. The Brad Edwards Lipslurs book is uh, a book that's been written uh, in, uh, recently in the, in the last decade or two, I'll say, uh, uh, Brad's, Brad's really great with, uh, he's really inventive with his, his pedagogy books. It's filled with lots of really good slurs for a low brass player. Brad Edwards lip slurs, very important book. Uh, the Charlie Vernon singing approach to the trombone and other brass instruments, very important book, lots of great exercises and, uh, great mythology, method, methodology for working on orchestral excerpts, I would say. Uh, let's see here. The, if you want orchestral excerpts as a trombone player, you know, the Megumi Kandi 100 excerpts, excerpts and the Doug Yo bass trombone version of that. Those are must-haves because, uh, you know, back in day when you wanted to work, back in my day when you wanted to work on orchestral excerpts, you kind of had to like go to the, go photocopy the excerpts but uh, and just kind of piecemeal your knowledge of them together. But those two excerpt books are incredible. The research that's, go, that's, that's happened behind them uh, and every excerpt has a little article about the composer and about how to approach the excerpt. Really great. Those are really great books. You know, and another, another book I'm going to mention that I have, I have most of my students read at some point during the course of their career is a book called Talent is Overrated by Jeff Colvin. Uh, and uh, I'm, I want to mention that book because I think it's so important for uh, young players to read because it's a book about the basic theme of this book is that what is more important for you to achieve your goals in life, more important than talent, is, is the, your work ethic. How, how, how much, how hard you work at honing your craft. 
And the book is written by Jeff Colvin, who uh, who was the editor of Fortune magazine for a long time, and he, so he's he's a guy that's uh, 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 accustomed to working with numbers and analyzing data. And what the guy does during the course of the book is he goes back and he analyzes the lives of people that are iconic for achievement in different areas of life. People like Mozart in our area, and uh, Tiger Woods in golf, and Jerry Rice in football, and uh, uh, Bill Gates in, in uh, technology. He, he talks about, he goes back and analyzes their lives and in a really, really uh, clear way shows you that, they, of course, they probably had some ability and they had some circumstances in their lives that kind of propelled them forward, but they worked really hard over the course of their career to achieve what they did. And uh, I think that's a really important concept for students to kind of latch on to. You know, if, if, if you're a student like me who, who was trying to take auditions coming from a small school and kind of felt like you were behind and felt like you didn't belong, the, the idea that it's not how talented you are, it's really not uh, where you're from or what school you attended, but what matters most is how hard you work. That idea is kind of a liberating and empowering idea, you know. And that's how uh, a music ed kid sitting at Jacksonville State University who wants to win an orchestral audition, that's how that kid, that, that idea can empower that student to say, you know what, I'm going to be the first person in the music building every morning. I'm going to do everything my teachers told me to do. I'm going to do it with passion, and I'm going to spend a lot of time doing it. And that's how a person achieves, really achieves their goals, really. So that's, uh, talent is overrated by Jeff Colvin. Very important book, I think, for for anybody that that's studying music. Yeah, I can totally relate to a lot of what you were saying there because I mean, I grew up in a small town in South Carolina, and well, I luckily I didn't start at IU because I don't know if I would have been ready for that as a student. And I got there, and you know, other people had gone to Interlochen for high school, or they had been studying at the Juilliard pre college and high school, and you're like, you know, you feel a little behind in certain ways, and. Uh, I mean, this might sound a little cheesy, but I mean, I remember growing up and watching all these Rocky movies, you know, and you're always, you have all these things about the underdog in your mind. And I'm sure there's a, quite a bit of that with you, like the way you came about it was probably very similar in that mindset. Absolutely. I had a chip on my shoulder, a real chip on my shoulder, because I, I knew I was, um, I was behind, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a kid from a small town in Georgia, you know. But uh, it, it fuels my fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually quite an advantage when you really look at it in the rearview mirror a lot of times. So I, I should be in a much better situation than I am. <laughs> um, I have a question from uh, Phil Truax, who's uh, another fine trombone player in Atlanta. He's watching with a lot of his students. Um, and he says, many of the college kids want to know what Mr. Pollard thinks, uh, how to maintain skills as an ensemble player as their college band shrink or move to smaller digital ensembles due to COVID? That's a great question. Well, that, that is a very, that's a very good question. Uh, that's that's going to be a challenge, you know? Uh, and I mean, uh, the overdub, the overdub program uh, programs that are, that are out, that's one way to do it. You know, if you have someone, someone kind of start the overdub project and record a track and send it around and everybody just tries to make sure their track is in tune and in time with that person. That's one way to do it. Uh, I have a program called the, uh, uh, I have an intonation program that's four part chorales that, uh, that a student can play, play along with. There, there are lots of resources for doing that. The honest truth is nothing play, takes the place of developing the reflexes and the instinct for for playing with another person and adjusting and following and matching, that's going to be a, a big challenge. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question, honestly. I mean, this is sort of the, beyond that. This is sort of the period of like learning how to play as like a studio player in a way, right? I mean, it re yeah, it really is, you know. Uh, but uh, like I said, I mean, even doing that, you you don't really develop the instinct and the reflexes that a, a really high level ensemble ensemble player has, you know, uh, I, th I think when this is over, people, people are going to, 
people are going to appreciate being able to play with other life human beings in the same room in a very special way. So, I, you know, there, there, some, something is going to be missing from music education until we can do that because there is uh, there nothing nothing can replace sitting beside someone and hearing them breathe and watching kind of watching them move out of the corner of your eye and just it's it's a very special kind of communication that happens there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I got another question. This is from William Brown, who's one of uh, uh, Holly's students from just a minute ago. He says, "Is someone looking to play bass and or tenor trombone professionally in the future? What advice could you give me about picking a college, and if you have any recommendations?" I'd imagine one place you would recommend. <laughs> well, I mean, I I think I think IU, uh, the Jacobs School of Music in the University. I mean, it's it's a very special situation. Uh, uh, I mean, there. Are, but don't get me wrong. There are a lot of great music schools, and uh, uh, but I think IU is special. One 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 thing about IU is that there are three trombone teachers here. If you want, if you want to study, if you want to play both bass and tenor, with the three teachers that are here, Carl Lenthy, Pete Ellison, and myself, you have three people that have played at a very high level on every low brass instrument. You know, uh, as we talked about before, you know. Carl has played bass trumpet in Munich, in the Munich Opera, and all over Europe. With, I mean, everywhere. He's and he's also a, an incredible tenor trombone player. Pete Ellison played in the Seattle Symphony for a long time. Played the played the Ring Cycle with Seattle Opera the whole time he was out there. And you know, I'm kind of the bass trombone guy on faculty. So you could come to IU and you could you could split your time between these three teachers and really with with high level players with people with a lot of experience. You know really get a lot of experience on both those instruments. So that's, that's, a, uh, that's a great advantage. The other thing about IU is that we have five orchestras, you know, four bands. We have jazz, uh, multiple jazz bands. Uh, there's just uh, – there's an unlimited amount of playing opportunity at Indiana University. You know, if, uh, for, at many schools that you attend, you know, you may have to wait for your turn in the rotation to play a concert in, in the semester. You know, at IU – you have your ensemble that you play in the whole semester, and uh, I think that's a very special thing. And beyond that, you know, if if you're if you're thinking about if you want to double if you want to double on bass and tenor, you know, uh, I would make sure that you have uh, good equipment. You know, make sure that you have especially mouthpieces that that are comfortable on both the instruments. Uh, can you, you know, can you talk about that. Like, what would you? What are your recommend? I know you have your own signature line of mouthpieces. As well, mm -hmm. we can talk about what what kind of are some basic uh, recommendations you have for that. You know, uh, this is a little bit difficult. Uh, it's difficult to recommend something to someone else because different people have different preferences for chop. You know, I I have a lot of friends that double. Uh, Nate Zagantz, for instance, there in uh, in Atlanta doubles a lot in, at a super high level. One of the best doublers I've uh, ever. You know, and also Brian Heck, the bass trombonist at the Atlanta Symphony. Also is starting to play a little bit of tenor, you know, and I, I, I'm trying to remember those guys. For me, uh, doubling is about having the same rim. I was fortunate uh, for a long time. I lived very close to Greg Black in New Jersey, and Greg Black is uh, – everybody knows Greg Black is uh, a great mouthpiece maker. And so I actually went to Greg's house, went to his shop, and had custom mouthpieces made for bass, tenor, and bass trumpet that all had the same rim. So for me, it's – it's very important to have the same rim when I switch back and forth between these instruments. For other people, they don't want the same rim. They want to, they want to develop a completely different uh, space on their lips, you know, uh, so they switch back and forth between completely different mouthpieces. So, I mean, different people have different preferences depending on your chops and your teeth. You know, you're going to have to experiment to find out what you, what, what you, what you want to do there. But I, but I think it's very important to do that. And, you know, uh, I'll say uh, if, if for a young player that's in, say, eighth or ninth grade and they're thinking about doubling on bass trombone, make sure you play tenor trombone really, really well before you switch to bass. Because uh, bass trombone with the second valve and with the, the drop of the register, you know, it's, it's another level. It's another set of, uh, of, of things that you've got to master. 
it, but you also still need to be a master of the tenor trombone register. So if you're someone that wants to learn how to double on bass, make sure that you have your fundamentals down on tenor trombone really, really, really well. You know where the intonation of the overtone series is. You know where a high, you got to raise a high G and a high F sharp. And, you know, you know all the basics of how to play a, a tenor trombone really well before you go to bass. That's what I did. You know, and I'm, I'm thankful that, that I had that knowledge base before jumping onto bass. Now, do you still play a fair amount of tenor trombone in your own playing? I mean, not 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 if I don't have to. You know, when I'm, <laughs> I mean, uh, in, in like I said in Bloomington, I'm I'm a bass trombone player, so I only play bass trombone and contrabass. It's only in New York when I have to play second or the occasional first trombone in an opera that I, that I play that I play tenor trombone. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about uh, IU. Yeah, the trombone players when I was in school were. Uh, Nate and uh, Toby Off, Steve Lang, Jonathan Raycraft, Luis Fred, Francisco Rosario. Do you know Francisco? I don't. Fantastic trombone player in Seville. Great player. You know, uh, yeah, those, it was okay. Chris Durth is another trombone player you might know at some point. Uh, Jay Heltzer, who's been in the Air Force Band now forever. Brandon Cheney, who just retired from the military. I mean, it was like pretty stacked trombone situation, you know. And and I have to say, all of those guys were incredibly disciplined. I mean, every one of them I mentioned, they were all like practiced very consistently. You know, it's funny. Uh, someone like Steve Lang was like one of the most consistent people I've ever seen in my life about how he dealt with his day. You know, super organized, you know. But, yeah, they were all good guys and, and uh, competitive. But, you know, it was fun hearing all those great players. But you had no idea what they were going to develop into, you know. It's, I'm really glad you mentioned uh, seeing seeing all of them early in life. I mean, that that really – it's it, there's no – there's really not a secret to, to, to how – to increase your chances of being successful in, in this business, you know. I know all of those guys now still, and I know they all still practice very consistently. You know, I mean, it really, that is a, that's a baseline uh, need. You've got to have the discipline to practice. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's phenomenal. All of them were like that and they were always playing corrals together. I mean, they played together all the time. The chairs were switching all the time, you know, and it's funny, you, you, know, you mentioned Nate. I don't know if you've seen this. His son is a very fine seventh grade trumpet player. Have you seen these videos, right, of him? I have. Yeah. And so he's played like over 60 days in a row outside. I mean, that's consistency like his dad. You know, it's very cool. Like, And, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting, too, because at that time the teachers were, were D. And Carl came out a little later when I went back to school. Uh, Keith, Keith Brown. Brown, Keith Brown, and and Ed Anderson. So, I just finished an article on Ed that's going to be in the uh, the IT the October ITA Journal, um, and uh, Ed passed away a couple, of, a little less than two years ago, and his his family uh, donated his entire music library, several of his instruments and mouthpieces and mutes and stuff to my studio and. It's been fascinating to go through that stuff, and uh, there there's some really interesting stories about Ed that that I'm going to share in this journal. Yeah, he he's the article. one of the three I knew the most because we would there would be the student faculty orchestras, and back then in the summer there was a student faculty orchestra, but in the but even during the year there was the uh, oh I'm going to think of it later, but there's a student faculty thing that would go on, and you would be playing Firebird and look down and see Ed Anderson, and you're like, how's this? What's going on here? <laughs> you know? But I remember, yeah. do you know, uh, and now we're just like kind of rambling a little bit, but you know, um, Tom Willigman told me the story about why Bach makes two bass trombone bones has to do with Ed Anderson. Do you know this? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, he, you know, I, 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 I did a lot of interviews about Ed uh, in the past couple of weeks, and he played a very unusual instrument. Uh, he played, uh, he had a 10 inch bell. Mm -hmm. He had an oversized bell, and uh, his uh, his F valve 
had extra tubing so that he could play a, the Einheldenleben low C in first position, where it's normally an F. He could for him it was a low C, and uh, that was uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit of this research that that I've done. Uh, the reason why he, he didn't always play that instrument. Uh, he played uh, when he first got into the Cleveland Orchestra. He, uh, he played a, a, a Bach a standard Bach with uh, valves that were dependent, not independent. And um, uh, it, they were on tour in New York at Avery Fisher, and there was a loading dock accident, and his instrument got destroyed, his, his, his beloved instrument, the one that he won the, the Cleveland Orchestra job on. And he just went on this mission to kind of find another instrument with all of the different uh, uh, details that he wanted in an instrument. And... Um, let's see here. It was, uh, I don't think it was, it was not, it, uh, Lauren, it wasn't Lauren Mazel. It was, uh, George Zell. George, George, it was George Zell. George Zell liked the oversized bell. That's, that's why he started playing the oversized bell. And, uh, the, the C, the C tubing is funny. Uh, uh, Ed, Ed said that it was Warren Deck the principal, the tubist of the New York Philharmonic, when Ed, Ed went to New York and played a concert with the Philharmonic, and Warren Deck was a really great craftsman. He, he, liked, he made tubas and made all kinds of stuff. Warren made, when Ed was in New York, Warren made that C, that C tuning slide for Ed. And uh, uh, I talked to Warren about this because eventually Don Harwood, the bass harmonist of the orchestra, started playing that, that, that tubing as well. And uh, Warren did... Warren didn't remember making it making it at all because he said, "You know what? I used to make stuff for a whole bunch of people. I, I it is so long ago I don't remember it at all." But what I think happened was uh, Ed Ed took that that C tubing design back to Bach and they started mass producing it. It became something you could buy straight from the factory. As far as the bell goes, I'm really not sure. It, it's possible that Ed had them uh, make a big a bigger bell. I'm not sure, but I, I mean it's entirely possible. The story that Tom Willigman told me was that he had, he was, I don't know if he was tenured or not in the orchestra, or it was very early on that, and Zell, and he, he thought Zell wanted something different, so he got a different bell made. He went to Bach and got a different bell made. And then he came back, and I guess Zell said, you have such a beautiful sound. Whatever instrument you won the audition on, that is exactly what you should be playing on. <laughs> So he was in his head a little bit before, you know, but, uh, no, he was a great, he was a great guy. Uh, he was very, very pleasant man and, and great player. So it's, uh, that's really great. And the other, and your students, there also get to play in these ad hoc ensembles all the time too, right? So they're constantly learning concerto parts and things like that. We have, yeah, we have a, a brass, brass concerto competition. Actually, every area has a concerto competition every year. There's a brass area concerto competition, woodwind and strings. And so uh, you learn all of the standard rep there. But also uh, the conducting students are constantly putting together ensembles to conduct rep and make videos and stuff like that. There's just an endless amount of playing at IU, as you can attest to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, before we go, I, I, the last one, one last thing we'll talk about is your practice schedule when you were a student and maybe your practice schedule in normal times, and maybe your practice schedule. During, sorry, during uh, my dog sees something out the window. I'm not sure. It's probably nothing. <laughs> but uh, and your practice during COVID, COVID times. What's how's that changed? Wow, that's it's changed a lot. Honestly, you know, uh, when I was a student, I'm gonna, and this is the God's honest truth. When I was a student, we talked a lot about my time at Jacksonville State University, very close to where you are now. Mm -hmm. I had three practice sessions a day. You know, like I said, I was really committed to trying to do this, do have this career. So uh, I I had a I had a session in the morning before my first class. Mm -hmm. I had a session in the afternoon. Well, let, I'll be more specific. My session in the morning was about breathing, buzzing, long tones, slurs, and Bordoni etudes, all of the the fundamentals of my instrument practicing the fundamentals, and then playing something melodic in all the registers of my instrument. That was my morning session. I came back in the afternoon, and I either had an excerpt session or I had a solo session. And then at night, I would go back a third time, and I, I would, you know, again, either an excerpt session or a solo session. So I had three 
sections of practice per day. And they, you know, they would vary a little bit from, uh, from day to day, but I mean, it was usually at least three hours a day of practice broken up over three sessions, you know, uh, and I, I had that kind of routine for many, many, many years of my life using metronome tuner, all that stuff. Now, uh, I mean, fast forward to, you know, the height of my career in New York. I, I mean, I, I, I practice when I can, you know, I honestly, I, uh, with, with the flight schedule and the performance schedule and the rehearsal schedule and all this stuff, I'm fighting to, to, to find, uh, uh, practice times, honestly, most of the time. Um, and then now COVID during COVID, you know, I, I've, I've maintained a warm up schedule for sure. And I'm uh, doing a lot of things that I normally do, but at the same time, I'm, I'm practicing things that I enjoy doing that I normally wouldn't be able to do like jazz. You know, I'm, I'm trying to blow over some changes every day. You know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, yeah. So I'm trying to do things that I right now that I, I normally would not have time for if I were, you know, playing in the opera full time. And that's, that's been, that's been a lot of fun for me. You know, the other thing I've been doing during the, uh, the, the uh, quarantine I'll, I'll mention as well is, you know, and, it's amazing that I was able to do this, but uh, at the end at the end of February, right before the quarantine happened, over the course over the course of ten days here in Bloomington, and starting starting at ten p.m. at night when I could get our hall, if you remember our hall, mm -hmm. I I recorded two solo albums, two solo uh, enough solo material for two solo albums. One is uh, an album of all French all French repertoire from the middle of the twentieth century. And the other one is they are all commissions or consortiums that I've been a part of over the last three years. So I was able to get that all in the can right before the quarantine. So another, th another thing I've been doing during the quarantine is just kind of going through all of that material and editing and just doing all the things that need to be done to get that up and going. So it's, that's been great to be able to do that. Yeah. That's, that'll be your fifth album. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I guess number four and five, those will be four and five. Non-traditional albums, I'm going to say. I'm probably not going to – I mean, nobody will buy a CD these days. I may make a, a short run of them, but it's going to be mostly about, you know, uh, online in distribution and YouTube kind of stuff, you yeah. know. And, and I'll say for, for people who are watching that aren't as familiar, you have a lot of online material, which is really great, uh, all about how you warm up and different excerpts and solos. It's, it's fantastic content. I was watching quite a bit of it. Like, yeah, you've really got that – that part of the game together, you know, that's, that's a lot of it. You know, that, and that all, you know, I started doing that. Um, I started doing that for two reasons. Number one, you know, as a teacher, you know, you get questions, you get lots of, lots of email questions. And, you know, I just figured, you know what, I, I know there's some basic questions that are happening over and over again. I'm just going to make videos that I think are going to cover a lot of aspects of these questions. And when somebody email emails me with a question, I'm just going to send them a link to that video and that I'm going to say, look, this video will answer your question more eloquently than I can do it right now. So I started doing it. And, but I also started, you know, recording stuff because let's face it as a professional player, when you have something, when you have something happening at a high level now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen at a high level a month from now. Or So when I worked something up and I knew this sounds pretty good and I want to have a record of this to show my students, you know, I, I just wanted to have a record of, of all the different things I was doing at the different times of my life. And, yeah. you know, I'm glad I did because some of those things that I recorded, you know, 10 years ago, I cannot do now, you know, like when I, when I played principal on Vutsek for the Met, uh, I recorded the, the complete Vutsek first trombone part. Because, and it's really hard. I couldn't do that now. I, if I had not recorded myself playing that part, then as an example for a student that may want to know what that part is supposed to be like, you know, I would not be able to do that now. So I'm, gl I'm glad I did that. Yeah, and that speaking of recordings, it maybe makes me ask one more question. Uh, because on these interviews, I always talked about recordings with people, you know, especially things that were important. And you mentioned that the pictures at an exhibition recording, which could have been one of like six different Chicago Symphony <laughs> recordings of that piece. What would you say are like three trombone recordings? or brass recordings, and maybe three not brass recordings you'd recommend to students? Okay. Uh, 
I would say let's let's go with orchestra first. I'm going to say I'm going to say I'm going to list that Chicago Symphony Orchestra pictures at an exhibition for sure. I'm going to say uh, uh, Mahler Two with the New York Philharmonic, Mahler, the Mahler Second Symphony. Yep. Uh, and gosh, are you going to make me pick a That'd third? That'd be the huh? one from the mid '80s that you're talking about, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And then I'm going to I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to throw in an opera. I'm going to say De Rosen Cavalier. Okay. Uh, you can find this on YouTube with uh, Christian Tielemann conducting in, in Baden Baden. And it's, uh, it's an all star cast of singers. De Rosen Cavalier is one of my favorite operas. And that's a great, that's a really great uh, recording on YouTube. For, for uh, solo trombone CDs, I'm going to say my first trombone solo CD, which was Slide Area with Joe Alessi. You know, I'm going to say Psychedelia with uh, James Markey, and oh man, you're going to make me pick a third, you know, I can't pick a third, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to say, there are two, two bass trombone recordings that I had early on that made a huge uh, uh, impression, Blair Bollinger's Fancy Free, mm -hmm. and Charlie Vernon's Eight Minutes to the Loop, both incredible examples of bass trombone sound, I'll say, and as far as non-trombone, non-orchestra CDs, uh, and I'm not, I'm going to kid you not. There are three albums that I list. Oh gosh, there's more than three. I'm going to have to say four albums that I listen to every day, every day. I listen to Stan Getz, a Stan Getz album playing Joe Beam. Okay. I listen to uh, uh, Alison Krauss. Uh, there's, uh, there's an album called Paper Airplane. I listen to every day, just a little bit. I listen to... Uh, at least one Diana Krall album every day. And one of my favorites is Live from Paris. I listen to a little bit of that practically every day. And uh, I, have a, I have a, it's actually a double album, Jackson Brown, Live, uh, li Live Jackson Brown, Volume 1 and Volume 2, where he's switching back and forth playing guitar and, and piano and singing all of his, a lot of his greatest hits. People are calling out songs from the audience. I, I listen to that practically every day. <laughs> Very good. That's yeah, it's it's important to be eclectic, and you're you're hitting all those different spots. And uh, by the way, before we go, I'll show you. Um, I don't know if you know these. Now, this is not the trombone one because I don't have any in stock. But have you seen these books? There's a trombone version of this. So wow, I have not. We will uh, when we we are going to print uh, for people that were wondering what that was. Uh, Benson Chickowitz's son, Michael, and I published three volumes of his dad's works and we've self-published but we have a bass clef version of that that has the long tone studies and it has selected etudes in that and um, I think that because I don't have it in front of me I know that I think Alessi and uh, Jay and Mick who is going to be on here soon uh, all wrote some in the front of it so I'll make sure you get a send you up a copy of that oh I would love to see that I got to play with him one time uh, off, and, uh, off stage for Pines of Rome with the Chicago Symphony. With, with, uh, with Vincent Chigowitz. No kidding. When would that have been? This was uh, in early 90s. Um, mid, mid 90s, excuse me. Was that right? Mid 90s? Uh, uh, no, let me get I let me get my my date straight here. It was when I was in Chicago, the Chicago Civic Orchestra. If I'm thinking about the same person, he was he was not he was not in the orchestra anymore. It was at Ravinia, and he came back to just be it. Could this be possible? I'm thinking not, but it could have been Will Scarlet. My guess. it was Will. Sorry, Will Scarlet. My it was Will Scarlet. Yeah, I got my I got my trumpet players mixed up there. No, sorry no, no, about no. that. They were in the section at the same time though, so. Very easy to do. Yeah. And Will was a great – Will is still alive, and he's, he was a fantastic teacher as well. So – but that's very cool. Yeah. that's Sorry, I got my Trump, my trumpet players mixed up there. I apologize. Yeah, you know, I know we're <laughs> – I know at this point that most people are probably going to stop watching because I'm talking, but I'll tell you a funny story about living in Indiana and Pines of Rome. So uh, Columbus, Indiana, as you know, is not far away. And so there was uh, – and they did – they did the Columbus, Indiana Philharmonic played Pines of Rome. And so the trumpet section of the time was uh, Marcus Goddard, who's now assistant principal in Vancouver, 
uh, Ingrid Rebstock, who is principal in Tenerife, and Mike Deshone, who is the assistant principal here in Atlanta. That was the on-state section. And I remember who was playing trombone. Um, but, I, but I know that they hired myself and a one-horn player to play the off-stage stuff. And we showed up and we were like, what? what's going on here, right? All of a sudden, the Columbus, Indiana North High School band shows up. Full marching bands. I mean, like sousaphones, saxophones. It's full on, you know? And I guess to get people packed in, the conductor who's still there, not a bad idea to sell tickets, right? Because you're going to get a lot of parents in. And, you know, there's a band arrangement that's in the same key as that last movement. And, all, and it, we might as well not have been there, right? And all of a sudden he turns and he cues and everybody comes in and it just sounds like <laughs> you hear this on orchestra on stage. It sounds quite good. And then you hear this, this cacophony of sound. And I thought, this is going to be awful. And so for the performance, I put a tape recorder, a cassette, and I, if I could find this cassette, I would put it online so fast. Uh, I might just say it's a different orchestra. But they, uh, I put it right under the last row of seats, and it was everything you dreamed it would be. And right in the, the penultimate measure on that beat of rest at the end, some kid on a Barry saxophone just lays into that rest. Ah. And, <laughs> as hard as you could. and, I mean, we must have listened to that 45 times that night. Just the whole last two minutes of Pines of Rome was incredible. But that's... Whenever hey, man. I think about offstage playing in, in uh, Respighi, that story pops That's up. That's fantastic. That's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> well, Paul, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and uh, get my technical difficulties or my pug that's apparently come to life at 8.30 at night all of a sudden, surprisingly. So uh, thanks a lot, and, and uh, hope we'll be in touch and, you know, Absolutely. Nice to meet you. And nice thanks you. for thanks for the time to just talk. And this is a lot of fun for me. And I wish you all the best. Hang in there during the quarantine to everybody that's listening. And we'll see you soon. Have a great one. Thanks. Thanks so much. Take care. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Take,